she is a is a her station. Okay, she's hot and this place is cold. You never know what she's going to do. You know what I'm saying? Shouldn't have said it. We're more primarily women in here, aren't we? <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. At least woke you up and got your attention, if nothing else. Hope nobody gets sick. Uh, all right. Good to see everybody. I wish I had some sort of funny story to tell or something. Um, but I have lived my life at work this week and uh, don't have really anything funny to say. Anybody else got anything funny to say? No? Okay. My baby's not doing too good this morning. She's having an off day. So she's doing a little clingy. All right. Well, I guess I'll just start in with some announcements here. Uh, let's remember Resurrection Sunday coming up. Be inviting people to that. Uh, if there's any kids that you know that you can bring or anything like that, we're going to be having some special things for the kids going on. Uh, so it's just always a good time to get a bunch of people here um, to hear about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Sister Polly is going to be doing an Asian cooking class Saturday, April 2nd. Um, you're both over. It's his birthday. Uh, let's see, if you have any quarter folders, you can turn those in to Sister Williams for the uh, Save Our Children fundraiser. We're doing a candy drive for the uh, candy cannon that we'll be doing for Resurrection Sunday. Uh, I think that's about it. If we could just get called, don't tell me the ladies are praying all the time, 24-7. If you're a lady, be in here in prayer. Call those dates. Uh, yeah, we're doing it. Is it this Wednesday? Are we in March? I was thinking when I was sitting here reading this, I was like, why are they announcing this a month ahead? I'm like, Whew, okay, forgive me. Okay, so this Wednesday night, I'm going to make this announcement. We're going to be doing the traditional Seder meal, uh, which is uh, basically the meal that the Jews would have partaken in uh, during the Passover, Passover, and then we'll be doing communion and foot washing uh, this Wednesday. So be here for that. Anyways, anything else I'm missing since I don't know what month we're in? Maybe somebody else should be doing an announcement. I think we're good. Let's have some prayer requests this morning. Let's remember Resurrection Sunday. Uh, let's remember all the guests that will be coming. Amen. And are there any other needs in the house this morning? Richard. We're praying. Good. Good. In Jesus' name, touch them shoulders right now. In Jesus' name. Sister Bishop, hold on. I'm trying to work my way back to you. Go ahead. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Chris? request we got this morning. Any other requests? Any other needs? I see. Cloth. We have several people hurting this morning. I'm going to pray that your bodies are touched this morning.
very trusting. He is able. He is able to do all things. Not only is he able to do all things, I love when the Bible says he does above and exceeding what we ask. Whatever we ask, he does above that. So if I ask for your body to be touched, God's going to do more than touch your body. He's going to make it to where it's not going to feel that ever again. In Jesus' name, this. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, God, you see this physical pain that's coming upon this congregation, oh God. Lord Jesus, you see this right now, God, and I ask right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, God, Lord, that this shoulder pain, God, that this back pain, God, Lord, that the pain, God, that we're feeling today, God, Lord, that right now, by the touch of your hand, Jesus, uh, Lord, that it would disappear immediately now in the name of Jesus Christ, O God. uh, Lord, according to the faith of your people, O God. uh, Lord, according to the work of your hands, O God. uh, Lord, by the blood that was spilled on Calvary, O God. uh, Lord, that we are healed, God. Lord, you see these different situations, God. uh, Lord, you see Sister Bishop this morning, O God. uh, Lord, you see Sister Rebecca this morning, O God. Lord, these situations. Uh, that need a touch from your hand, oh God. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would do it now, Jesus. Do it now, Jesus. Uh, Lord, we give you all the praise, oh God. Uh, Lord, we're so grateful, God, for your working hand, oh God. We're so thankful, God, uh, that you touch us in our times of need, oh God. Uh, Lord, and we give you all the praise and all the glory, oh God. Uh, We thank you for it this morning, and we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, can we give him a hand clap this morning? My God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Touch us this morning, God. Touch us this morning, God. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. In case you did not know, this is the church of the living God. We're in Sunday school prayer we can be touched. We can be touched coming in the foyer if we want to be. You can be touched anytime in the house of God. Jesus' name. We don't hinder the anointing. We, lo- we flow with the anointing. The anointing is God's purpose and God's plan. And when he moves, we move with him. In Jesus' name. God's going to touch that pain this morning. In Jesus' name, coming over our people. In Jesus' name. Forgive me, I got a mint because I ate some chocolate. And I don't want to be all smelly. So this morning, our subject is going to be everyone and evangelist everyone and evangelist I feel like God has I feel like this morning even what's happened I feel like God is lining up what he's wanting to teach to us this morning um, I'm thankful that he's already showed up in this place when we think of an evangelist uh, rightfully so we more than likely think of a preacher of the gospel we think of someone who is Uh, certified or has the giftings to hold special services Uh, typically where people uh, lost people come to the Lord they receive salvation and things on that manner but there are several different offices of an evangelist and that's what I really want to talk about this morning Um, second Timothy uh, four and five my my throat is really hurting could you please go get me a bottle of water second Timothy four and five says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now, you could focus on the fact that Paul was writing to his son in the gospel, Timothy, and that Timothy was pastoring several churches, and he said to watch in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Um, But we also understand that all scripture is given for correction, for reproof, for doctrine, edible or edifying to the body of Christ. So if we believe that all scripture is given for instruction, then today in Sunday school we can say that we should all watch in all things. It does not matter if you are a pastor, it does not matter if uh, you are in ministry, 
Uh, Your adversary walks around as a lion seeking whom he may devour. And if we are not watching, he will creep up and he will uh, cause things on us. Endure afflictions. Afflictions will come. Afflictions come. Whoever talks about uh, living for Jesus is the easy life is not. They don't really understand scripture uh, because Jesus said, don't, don't, don't. Be confused when afflictions come, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, but they will come. And then he gets to do the work of an evangelist. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Where we're going to be drawing from is the character. The thing about the Bible is the Bible is so concentrated. It's so, there's so much that God could have put in his word, but due to the fact that we can't, we couldn't carry around uh, huge encyclopedias, he had to condense. Thank you, baby. He had to condense what he put in there. Would y'all forgive me and let me get a drink of water right quick? Uh, no, I, I, I need to finish this mint, or else I'm going to be slobbering all over again. Hang on. Let me get a drink of water. So the Bible is very concentrated. So when you read about a character in the Bible, um, the only thing that the Bible said about Enoch was he walked with the Lord. But man, what an awesome thing to be put in the Bible about a man is that he walked with the Lord. And what I'm saying is, is there can be so much found in such little reading. A very, very powerful man that we read about in the Bible is his name was Philip. And we all know a lot about the Apostle Paul. We all know a lot about Peter. And we know a lot about these big-name, powerful men. Um, but Philip was actually a very, very important person to the early church. He's given about two chapters, roughly, in Acts. And he's mentioned in other places. But these two chapters, if you really sit down and you just look at everything that Philip was doing and accomplishing, it was just simply amazing that there were so many men of this caliber walking among that first church. And uh, so I'm just going to read a few accounts here, and you can bear with me because we're going to come back to them as we go out throughout the lesson here. Um, Chapter 8, first of all, is is one of the chapters that you can read about Philip, and I would encourage you in your own time, just this week, if you're reading, go to Acts chapter 8 and read about this man. He was an incredible, incredible, powerful man. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, we're in chapter 8, verse 5, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 5. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now, this is not my scripture focus today, but I do find it interesting, the wording here. Uh, you go back in verse 6, and it says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. That he is lowercase there, meaning God had given Philip the authority to actually perform miracles, not for Philip's glory, but what was happening because of this. Many people were coming to Christ. If you want a dead, washed-up religion, you can find them by the hundreds. But if you want a religion that actually has the power not to change your physical condition only, but has the power for eternal salvation, then you have found it when you have found the church of the living God. Amen. Which is why I believe in praying for healing in Sunday school. And I believe in prayer for certain situations at any time because it attracts faith and faith leads people to Him. And that's the goal. The goal is not to worship healing. The goal is not to worship him giving us money when there is no money. The goal is to bring as many people as we can as close to him as we can get them. And Philip had a hold of this, and because Philip had a hold of this, God let him perform many mighty miracles. Amen. Going in verses 26 through 31, and then we'll jump from 31 to 35. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, And go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Everyone say, which is desert. 
Hold that in your minds for a little while. And he arose, verse 27, and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And then verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. Everyone say the same scripture. And preached unto him Jesus. Again, when we think of an evangelist, we think of a person who has been ordained or called of God to preach in the pulpit, um, who has dedicated himself to do whatever he can for God whenever he can do it. But how does that relate to us in the pew? And we're going to look at a couple of different characteristics of Philip today. Philip was one of the seven men in the Old Testament church, or I'm sorry, in the New Testament church. Uh, what had happened was is the church was growing so, so rapidly. And obviously the Spirit was governing it all, but we see that so many people were looking to the disciples, the, the men that were with Jesus. They were looking to Peter. They were looking to, to all of these men. And these men couldn't handle the basic functions of the church because they were dealing with so many, uh, you know, I would say spiritual issues, if you will. And that's really how the Bible labels it. So the church, it arose a time that they had to actually appoint men. And these is, this is kind of where we get deacons or, or get leaders in the church. They had to appoint men to oversee uh, the financial workings of the church and to oversee uh, the distribution of goods and things of that manner. And Philip was one of these seven men. Now, what is interesting about these seven men is they had three characteristics that the Bible talks about. Okay? The first one was that they were full of the Holy Ghost. And the second one was that they were full of wisdom. And the third one was that they were chosen and ordained for service. And again, I want to keep in mind that we're talking about everyone in the evangelist this morning. So the seven men were full of the Holy Ghost. To be full of the Holy Ghost simply means that we have an effectual a heart, a heart towards God, that we are constantly seeking God, and we have a deep concern for the care of others. A relationship with God always directs us for care towards our fellow neighbor or brethren. It's a, it's an out, it's a um, byproduct of a relationship with God. Also, a man who is full of the Holy Ghost is going to have the fruit of the Spirit. And moreover, the Scripture indicates that faith accompanies one filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 6 and 5 it says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Permanus, and Nicholas, and a couple other names I can't pronounce. And these were the men that God ordained to do basic oversight in the church. And I guess my point this morning is, is that in an ordained church of God, every single person that operates in this church should be full of the Holy Ghost. Now, I am not saying that you have to reach some spiritual uh, pinnacle. You have to reach some high place. You have to be, you know, you have to have that special call with God. You don't have to have a special call to be full of the Holy Ghost. Some of the most powerful people in our church or in any church anywhere are people who really nobody knows their name. I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Two powerful people at this church, and they didn't know I was going to say this this morning, so... They can just take it with what it is. Now, everyone knows Sister Caban's name around here because she does so much for us. She serves this church. And what a beautiful example of a God-given servant in a church. Thank you, Sister Caban. You will have a great reward in heaven. You don't seek for it, but you're going to have it one day in Jesus' name. But we might not all. Sister Caban doesn't stand up here. She doesn't speak, and she don't just, just open up and start speaking in tongues. But I will tell you that when Sister Caban prays with somebody, 
If you have never seen Sister Caban pray with somebody, when she begins to pray, she is very, very powerful. God moves with her to do what she says. And she is just a, she, um, she's just a, a worker at this church. But she's powerful with God. She's very powerful with God. Uh, another powerful woman at this church who we know because we're so small, but let's say we're a larger church, um, Sister Tomasa. Now, you not everyone knows her name, not everyone that walks in, and she just kind of walks around and greets people, and she smiles, and she loves people. And I believe that when people walk away from Sister Tomasa, they think, there's something about that woman. She has a hold of God, and that's why. But I'll tell you, that when Sister Tomasa goes and prays for somebody, or she even prays for people from her seat. She'll just, if I see her, she'll point her hands, or she'll get a burden, and she'll start praying. And she's very, very powerful. They are full of the Holy Ghost. The general population at this church should be full of the Holy Ghost. We should all be full of faith and the Holy Ghost. does not matter what position you hold or do not hold. As a general person, we are to be full of the Holy Ghost, which is to have the fruit of the Spirit. It is to have faith, have faith, have faith, have faith that God can do what he said he would do. Now, a byproduct of being full of the Holy Ghost is having a wellspring of supernatural wisdom. If you are full of the Holy Ghost, you will also be very wise. Now, to be knowledgeable and to be wise, we know, are two very, very different things. Most people are more knowledgeable than myself. At my workplace, they know more about things than I do. and they. But it is funny that grown men and men that have been living life a lot longer than me will come to me for advice on things that you wouldn't think a 22-year-old would be giving advice to a 35- or 40-year-old man about. But when you have the Holy Ghost and you are full of faith, God gives us supernatural wisdom. You cannot be powerful and not be wise. You can't have, be full of faith and not be wise. We can know that God wants to heal everybody, and we can know that God wants to see everybody have salvation, but you have to be wise in the conduct that you go about those things. Full of wisdom. And then the third trait of those seven men, which Philip was one of, and everyone's an evangelist is where we're working up to today, is that the seven were chosen and ordained for service. I talked a few weeks ago um, and pastors even talked about it. But nothing is sacred anymore. Nothing is valuable anymore. He, I, I remember him talking about a few weeks ago. You, you, you used to leave the church unlocked. Nobody would come into a church. It was a very sacred thing. It was a very, the sanctuary was something, it was just special. And it wasn't just in our, the United Pentecostal Church or Pentecostal churches. It was churches globally. You, you know, they were sacred. They were something that were set apart. And now there is such an attack on things being sacred. But what we have to understand is that the church is a very sacred thing. The church is something that is very, very sacred because it is separated for a purpose that it, it's, it's more than just this natural realm. It's more than just this earth that we're on. We, when we walk in here and we begin to deal with the word of God and we begin to deal with men's souls, we're now stepping out of the realm of temporary and we're going into the realm of eternity. And that is so sacred. When you're talking about the well-being of someone's soul, that is sacred. The reason, and, I, and I'm just going back because the Lord's already moved this morning a little bit, but the reason that I, I want people to know that God wants to heal them is because when we know that God has the ability to heal us, right, and we're dealing with physical pain, that gives us a reflection of God that is not true, that God wants us to go through this pain, that God wants us to do this. But if we understand that it's not God's will for us to go through pain. Now, there are times where we will endure afflictions, guys. There are times where we will go through things that are for our betterment. Because I've said it before, but God is much more concerned with your faith and your eternal salvation than he is your temporary circumstance. If you have to temporarily deal with pain to get where God wants you to be, you will do it all day long. I'm just going to tell you. And that's why you have to have wisdom. Because sometimes I don't pray for people to be healed. Because sometimes, you know, I know God is trying to do something. Anyways, I'm not going to go into all that. 
But what I'm saying is, is everything reflects God in this sanctuary. Everything that we do, when we are ugly to somebody, when we brush off somebody, when we judge somebody, that is a direct reflection of how they will view our God. And what I'm saying is, is this is a sacred place. This book is sacred. God's people are sacred. And when these men were chosen, the Bible says that the leadership of the church laid hands on them and anointed them and called them to the service that they were to do. And people that work in our church, they should be full of the Holy Ghost. They should be full of wisdom. But we also understand that they are ordained by this church to do a work for God. Now, in the book of Ephesians, the office of an evangelist is listed among the fivefold ministry. Okay, Prophet, uh, apostle, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Okay, uh, The pastor grounds the church. Uh, the evangelist gathers people into the church. The prophet uh, guides the church. The apostles govern the church. That's what I'm missing. Teacher. Teacher. Did I say teacher already? No? No? Teacher grounds the church. Pastor guards. Teacher grounds. Evangelist gathers. Prophet guides. And apostle governs. And it's one of those fivefold ministries that the evangelist is listed in as a gatherer, someone who gathers people into the house of God or just gathers people to Christ. Now, the Vines Expository Dictionary defines an evangelist as simply a messenger of good. And in another word that the Greek uses, it's actually just translated preacher. And before you say, okay, well, that's a calling, a preacher literally means a proclaimer, someone who proclaims. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is when you're on your job site or you're on, you're talking on the phone with your, your relative and you begin to boldly proclaim the word of God in some fashion, believe it or not, you've actually just become what the Bible calls a preacher because you've began to proclaim the word of God. Now, you might not be a, a called preacher to a pulpit or to mass congregations, but what I'm saying is the Bible at some level has called every one of us to proclaim the gospel. It is if God just kept proclaiming the gospel to his handful of ministry, this world would never be reached like it's supposed to be reached. At any level, this world would never be reached at the level that it's supposed to be reached. Everyone is called to proclaim the, 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 the word of God. So, obviously, Philip in the Bible, as we're, that's who our, our character's subject is today, Philip was a pulpit evangelist, okay? He was someone that was called to the pulpit ministry. The Bible says that he held many, many revivals or campaigns where people were healed, people were uh, brought to salvation. And the Bible says that every time he left the city, there was great joy in that city. Wow. When I'm talking about a powerful man, I'm talking about a man who would go into a city that was just afflicted with all sorts of things. And when he would leave, the, that city, the whole temperature, the whole atmosphere would be completely different just because one man passed through. Let me tell you something. Your job can be a different temperature when you walk onto the scene. Your home and your family, if you will be full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, you can step into any situation and the temperature will change. Whatever was there before, when we leave, it should be different. When we sit down at a table to eat dinner, by the time I leave that place, I want my waiter or waitress to know the temperature of this room has changed because we've been there. Not because we're trying to draw attention to ourselves, but because we let the light of God shine through us and change things. Every time we step into a situation, it should change. But that's not where we're at today. We're not preaching to the multitudes. We're not preaching to the masses. We're not preaching to the city. I pray. Did you know the only prayer request Jesus ever made? I will take you for and say it not my prayer. The only prayer request Jesus ever asked for. Woo, I got to take him to lunch. Right now. You see me up here. I'm going to lunch. Pray, therefore, that God would send laborers into the field. 
His only prayer request he ever made was that God would call more of us to be preachers. And that's what I'm saying this morning. I do pray that God causes more of us to be preachers, but not everyone is called to that. But what everyone is called to is what we read about in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 31. And that's where we're going to stay probably for the remainder of this lesson this morning. Verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Everyone say, which is desert. Now you have to understand, if you read the previous verses of what's going on here, it's Philip holding this great revival in the city of Samaria. That's where uh, it says just in the in the verses before, it says, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And we see that all of this great thing was going on in Samaria. And so Philip's in the middle of having this great revival. Come on, you know what it's like when you leave a good church service, right? Everything seems better. The, when you walk outside, the air feels cooler. The sun looks brighter. Wherever you're going out to eat, it's going to be better. There's just nothing like being in the presence of God. There's nothing like it. It makes everything better. And so you got to understand, Philip was kind of on this this high, I guess you could call it. He was seeing all of these great things. He was performing the work of the Lord. And there's nothing more satisfying than performing the work of the Lord. And then the angel of the Lord came to Philip and said, Now look, I know you're right here and you're experiencing all this greatness, but now I want you to go to a place which is desert. And now you've got to really understand what he was calling to. He was calling to an empty place, to a barren place. He was in this place of fruitfulness. He was in this place of abundance. He was seeing miracles. He was seeing all of this. And now the angel of the Lord is going to tell him to go to a place which is desert. And then we read on, it says in verse 27. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we don't read on. And the Bible doesn't even say why he's calling him. The Bible doesn't say I'm calling you into a place which is desert because you're going to see great and mighty things there. Or I'm calling you into this desert because you've got to go and experience. He just said, I want you to go off into the desert. But, verse 27, and he arose and went. He didn't question why the Lord was calling him to that place. He didn't question why the Lord was doing or why he was calling him to go where he was going. And likewise, when the Lord speaks to us to go places, if we don't understand, we should not question. We should just go. The Lord says, do something, save yourself a lot of heartache and trouble, and just do what the Lord is saying to do. Verse 27, and he arose and went, and behold, a man. Say, I'm sorry, but say a man with me. See, when we say man, we say it so cold and so callously, but God created each and every man. And I believe that any time God references a man in the Bible, he says it with such a loving undertone. The same way I would say Layla or Mariah, I say it with love and affection. So when you're reading the Bible and you hear about a man, you think about what the Lord is doing. Because he cares about this man that he's talking about right here. And a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, there's a lot of things going on here that we really need to understand. First of all, eunuchs under the Jewish law were not allowed in the synagogues to worship. If you were a eunuch, you were not allowed in the synagogue at all to worship. You couldn't even come to the doorstep. You had to stay outside. And so we see that this man was so hungry for God. God had flipped on that light switch of faith in his life, and he was now hungry for something. So he went to a place to see God where he wasn't even allowed to go. And we make so many excuses why we can't come to church. Anyway, we're allowed in here. But I'm telling you, when you get hungry for God, you'll get down on your all fours, and you'll say, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I can be made whole. There's something about desperation that causes us to draw so closer to the Lord. So, we see, first of all, that he was a eunuch. But, not only was he a eunuch, we see something else. That he was a eunuch with great authority. He was someone with, pro- he, had, he was important. And so, we see that Philip was being directed by the angel of the Lord to meet this man who was not allowed to worship, but who was a man who had authority and who had 
power. So let's read here. So uh, let's read the last part of the verse there. And had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, meaning he probably got to the synagogue and they said, whoa, whoa, buddy, you got a mark on you. You're a eunuch. You can't come back. So he was returning. But when he was returning, he didn't get to experience what he wanted to experience. He didn't get what he needed to get from the Lord. He knew that there was something more. So he sat in his chariot and he began to read the word of God. He said, that's fine. If I can't go in there and worship, many of us, if we got rejected from worship, we would throw a temper tantrum, we would pout, and we would go home. And we also wouldn't get an answer from the Lord either. If we would keep our spirits right, no matter what happened to us, God would speak to us. And he was sitting in that chariot, and he began to read Isaiah the prophet. He wanted to hear from God. He didn't care where it came from. He didn't care who it came from. He said, that's fine. If they won't let me in their church, I'll sit right here in my car, and I'll read the book of Isaiah. But that eunuch didn't know that he was sending a soul winner with him. He was sending someone to speak to him. Then the Spirit said, verse 29, said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Y'all know I love expository preaching. I love breaking down these words and stuff, so you don't have to stick with me this morning. I like that he said, join yourself. So many times, right, the Lord spoke to mine a few weeks ago, several, several weeks ago now. And there, we went out to eat one day to this, this little restaurant, and we just felt attached to this person. We really felt like God wanted us to win this person to the Lord. And we left that day saying, you know what, we need to go back there. We need to talk to them again. We need to go back there. We need to talk to them again. Now, I'm just being honest, transparent. We've never been back to that restaurant since. I don't really like the food all that much. Um, anyways, you can judge me if you want, but hey, I'm human, and we don't all do everything right all the time. If you think I do, then you're deceived greatly. But what if when God opened up a door to minister to somebody, we joined ourselves to him? We didn't think about what can I just get out of this moment and then leave and move on and start living my life again. But what if we joined ourselves with that person? You know what? You know, I believe we're talking today for a reason. Can I just get your number? Maybe I can text you sometime. Join ourselves to him. The Spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And he's sitting on his chariot. Verse 30. Philip, guys, we have got to get this kind of obedience. This is for me this morning. I believe that if we would be more obedient, we would see more of what God wanted us to see. Because it was not, what, what just happened here? And the Spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Look what happens in verse 30. And Philip ran. God spoke to him. He was out in this desert place. He wasn't back in Samaria seeing the revival that he was seeing. He was out in this desert, and he was just walking, and he's walking on, and he sees a chariot, and the Holy Ghost speaks to him and says, go go near that chariot. And so he starts walking near that chariot. And what does he say? Something else? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, Oh, yeah, and he ran to that chariot. I'm sorry. He ran to where God was trying to take him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. Philip was pretty bold. Philip knew some of the scriptures. Philip had seen a lot of things, so he was bold in the Holy Ghost, which is a good thing. He says, do you really understand what you're reading right there? Do you really understand what you're talking about? When people confront you with a question about the Bible, did you know that they want you to say something to them that they can't get by themselves? They see the mark of truth on us. They know when we talk, we're speaking truth. And so they'll bring up conversations that they wouldn't have with any other person, but they want us to explain truth to them. So he heard him reading. Do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, and he said, How can I except some man should guide me? I love the way that the Bible words things. This wasn't just some man that he was talking to. This was Philip. Philip was seeing great revival. Philip was a leader in the church. Oh, I'm out of time. Philip was powerful, but the Bible says that he just called him some man. What I'm trying to say is, is it doesn't matter if you're powerful or not in the sanctuary. Some man, any man, can explain scriptures to any person. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you then became some man that can explain scriptures. You just became some man that can lead somebody to the Lord. And I don't have time to finish this. That wasn't anointing. But what happens is it says he started where Philip or where the eunuch was at, which was in Isaiah, and he began to preach unto him Jesus. 
because you can start at any place in this in this Bible and start to talk about Jesus, and I guarantee you the end result will be what happened to that eunuch, which is that he was filled with the Holy Ghost, he, he was saved, and God did a work in this powerful man's life. You don't have to be Philip the great and mighty. You don't have to be Philip the miracle worker. You can be some man and you can start at the place that they're at and you can preach unto them Jesus and you can see what you want to see. Everyone is an evangelist. Everyone is an evangelist. And who knows, I might finish that next week because I had another 45 minutes to go. Brother Cooper, let's go. When we opened up Sunday school this morning, I'm felt the Holy Ghost move because God doesn't want us to be sick in our body. I don't love you like the Lord loves you, but I know that when you hurt, it hurts you. When you go through pain, that bothers me throughout the week. And if I'm a carnal man, I'm a natural man, how much more does it bother God when we go through pain in our body? When God moves and the Holy Ghost moves, God can move. When you feel the Holy Ghost hit you, you do what he told you to do. If someone is sitting there and they're explaining their life and their trouble to you and they're crying and you feel moved on to speak in tongues, you better speak in tongues. That is God trying to save somebody's soul and we better not stand in the way of that happening. I don't care how you think you might look or what you might think you look like. The Bible says that tongues is given for them that do not believe, not for us who believe. If God's, if you start praying with somebody and they pray with you two minutes, God starts to do for a minute, and you start praying and you feel the Lord of glory moving over you, you better do whatever he's telling you to do. If he, now listen, God is never, God is the ultimate wise one. He's never going to lead you to do something that he knows is going to cause destruction on somebody else. If he leads you to lay hands on him, on that person, you lay hands on that person. You don't have to be weird and crazy, but you do what the Holy Ghost tells you to do, and you see what the outcome is. I'm going to tell you what, I'm, I'm finishing up with a story. When I went to ministry training, the church that I went to was just, was unlike, I mean, I'm not, you don't understand, I'm not saying anything bad about this church. I'm just saying that church was just, it was at a different place. And it was just unlike anything I'd ever experienced. Brother, you should start passing out more. Um, and uh, we're going to take up Sunday school offering here. And we were having dinner one night at the house. Uh, every Monday night at that church, they do what's called family night, which is where families in the church, they all get together and they go to different houses. It's a fellowship thing. And I thought it was a great, great thing. It was a great thing for the church to fellowship. And at the end of dinner, we all sat in the living room and we began to talk. And, I, we, you know, we don't do that here. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Like I said, they were a bigger church, much larger church. They did things differently. And so I'd never done anything like that. We were all just sitting there and this one man began to talk and he began to tell about his wife who had left him. He began to cry and weep. And I was like, Whoa, bro, we don't know each other. We're all just sitting here in this living room. But you know what? The church of the living God should be able to minister to each other at all times. We should be able to be up front with what we're going through. we got to stop living behind these masks. Anyway, so he just began to speak and tell his problems. And then there was another man sitting across the room. And, God, we're just sitting in the living room of this house. And this man just opens up and gives a, a tongue to be interpreted. So I'm looking around. I'm bowing my head. And I'm like, look, I'm peeking, you know. I'm like, what's going on here? And then you know what? Someone gave an interpretation, and it was for that man. And then and then uh, one of the men got up, and they went over there, and they laid hands on him. Then all the other men got up, and they laid hands on him. And God ministered to him right there, right there. We weren't in a church service. We didn't have an altar call. But God can move at any time if we will let him. God can move any time. Because when you start to talk about Jesus, you know what I tell you to do? When you're reading through your Bible, when you're reading through the New Testament, you take your pen, you take your highlighter, Anytime you see and they preach Christ, I want you to highlight it. And when you get to the New Testament, or you get to the end of Revelation, I want you to write a number at how many times it said they preach Christ. It's because anytime you start to talk about God, he shows up. Anytime you start to talk about Jesus Christ, he shows up. And when he shows up, anything can happen. When he shows up, whatever we're going through can be fixed in an instant because he is the way maker. All things are possible, not with me and you. With Christ Jesus. He is our everything. Everything we do is around Jesus Christ. Everything. Let's dismiss in prayer. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word today, God. I'm thankful for the faith that I feel in this house, God. I pray right now in the name of Jesus as this will carry over into our service, God. 
Lord, today, God, that it's not about the signs and it's not about the wonders, God. We just want to see you, God. Lord, we just want to feel you in this house, oh God. We came today to hear and to get direction from you, God. And I pray that all of these needs, God, I just really ask you, God. Lord, if there is somebody with physical pain in their body, God, right now, that would hinder them, God, from worshiping you, God. Touch their bodies right now for your glory, Jesus. God, if there's somebody going through a situation, God, that's clouding their mind, God, it's weighing on them right now. In Jesus' name, touch that situation that we could see you today. Oh, mighty God, I ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone said in Jesus' name. Amen.